Well, greetings out there in YouTube land, and welcome to the beginning of what I think will be a very comprehensive and hopefully rewarding video series. In order to achieve my final goals for this series, uh, we're going to have to start off with a review of power supplies and the difference between RMS and peak voltage. We'll discuss the differences between half wave rectification, full wave, and full wave bridge rectification. And ultimately, I'm going to present to you a very unusual type of power supply called a voltage doubler, in which we can put in 120 volts and get out 240 volts. I know it sounds like something for nothing, but the real benefit of this type of power supply is economic. It will allow us to design a tube effects circuit uh, and a very simple amplifier circuit that can be powered uh, not by an $85 high voltage transformer, but by two very basic and uh, inexpensive 12 volt to 120 volt filament transformers. If this sounds at all intriguing, then uh, let's get started on our brief review so that we can fully understand the voltage doubler uh, power supply. Here we have Jack enjoying his morning fix of catnip. Okay, Jack, enough catnip. Time now to retrieve your toy. Ready? There it is. Go get it. Wow, I see you've been studying some of Rusty's moves. The difference between the measurement of AC and DC really becomes significant when we deal with rectification, and that really is the topic of this video series. Many people uh, don't realize that the AC power supply provided by the receptacles in your home uh, is really not 120 volt AC power. I realize in other parts of the world you use 240 volts AC, uh, but the principles involved are exactly the same. The only difference will be, in your case, the numbers that I'm using will be doubled. Okay, here's the first shock to some of you, and that is the wall receptacle really puts out uh, 170 volts AC, uh, and that's measured from this voltage peak, which is plus 170 AC, down to the trough, which is minus 170 volts AC. And as we will see, this is what is called peak voltage measurement. Now, uh, when we rectify this alternating current, and in this video series, we're going to discuss four different ways to accomplish that. We will end up, in most cases, with all of the peaks on the same side of the horizontal axis and therefore this is considered to be direct current. In fact, it's 170 volts of positive direct current, but we can see there's tremendous amounts of rippling here, absence of uh, voltage in between the peaks. Now this ripple, if it's not dealt with, is going to cause a very loud hum in our amplifier. Uh, and depending on the type of rectification, it will either be a 60 or 120 hertz hum. So before we use this rippled DC, we're going to have to fill in these gaps somehow so that we have a smooth DC current. As you can see down here, true direct current is a straight line. There is no ripple at all. This is hum free, and this is a perfect type of voltage to use on our amplifier. To achieve this very smooth form of direct current, we're going to use filter capacitors. Now, I explain how they work in great detail in my video on filter capacitors, but uh, for today's discussion, uh, let's just uh, have a quick review of how it works. As the voltage is increasing here, the filter capacitor is charging up. As it decreases, the filter capacitor discharges and fills in the gap. Uh, over here, as this uh, voltage is rising in this peak, filter capacitor is charging. Then as it starts to drop off, the filter capacitor fills in 
the gap. And as you can see then, we end up with a really nice straight uh, form here uh, of waves once we shave off the tops with our filter capacitors and fill in the gaps we now have the very smooth form of direct current that we want for our amplifier power supply. Now the amount of shaving and uh, ripple filling can be mathematically calculated uh, to great accuracy and it was found regardless of the voltage involved. In this case, it's the plus 170 volts of very rippled DC. If we multiply that peak voltage, which is 170 volts, by 0 0.707, we'll get 120 volts, which is actually the equivalent voltage of direct current that it requires to do the same amount of work as the 170 volts of rippled current. In other words, when you take off the peaks and put them into the uh, rippled spaces in between the peaks and turn this waveform into a nice smooth form of direct current, uh, we are eliminating uh, about 30% of the peak and using it to fill in the gaps between them. And so to mathematically convert our peak output with all its ripple into the uh, amount of voltage we will have in the smooth DC form that we're going to use in the amplifier, we multiply the peak voltage, which is 170 volts, times 0 0.707, or you can divide it by 1.414, and in each case, you'll get a value, uh, which is what we call the RMS voltage. And in each case, it's 120 volts. Now, this is why we're told that our household voltage is 120 volts AC. Because if you rectify it, smooth it out, and uh, turn it into DC, it is exactly 120 volts of DC. However, to get this 120 volts of DC, due to the shaving and filling that is required to do this, we have to be supplied with 170 volts of AC so that we have enough peak to fill the gaps and turn it into the 120 volts of RMS voltage. You also may be wondering why if you plug your voltmeter into a wall socket, uh, you will measure 120 volts. The reason for this is that AC voltmeters automatically correct peak voltage into RMS voltage readings. The voltmeter did indeed read 170 peak volts at the receptacle, but then internally corrected it to 120 volts RMS. The fact it does this without telling you or with no outward indication is, I think, a big reason why so many people are unaware of the difference between peak and RMS voltage. Okay, Jack, now that you've wolfed down some catnip, you ready to play retrieve the toy? Here goes. There it is. Go get it. Pick it up and bring it back. That's what retrieve means. No, don't roll around on it. I think you've been picking up some bad habits from Rusty. Okay, uh, with that review behind us, uh, let's move on then to our very brief discussion of how diodes work. Diodes are tubular devices, uh, rather small, and as you can see there's a band at one end. Let's see what that band represents and how these uh, little rascals work. Diodes uh, are represented on schematics by a arrow head that is pointing at a vertical bar. And the bar corresponds to the band on the uh, diode body. If the band is on the right side, then the diode is in this configuration. If the band is on the left side, then it's in this configuration. Diodes, depending on their orientation, will only allow positive voltage or negative voltage to pass through them. 
If you apply 120 volts of AC to a diode in this orientation, uh, it will only allow the positive parts of the wave to pass and therefore it will convert 120 volts of AC into plus 60 volts DC. By the same token, if we apply the same 120 volts of AC to a diode in this orientation, it will only allow the negative portions of the wave to pass and it will then alter the 120 volts of AC into minus 60 volts of direct current. Now you can make two observations. Uh, number one, it's very inefficient. We lose half of our voltage. Okay, the 120 becomes uh, 60 and that's why it's called a half wave rectifier because uh, only half of the wave is allowed to pass. And secondly, the amount of ripple when you use a single diode as a rectifier is huge. Look at this empty space in between. Okay, so your filter capacitors are going to have their hands full trying to fill in that gap. Fortunately, there are all sorts of different configurations uh, for the diodes that will eliminate uh, almost all of their drawbacks. Uh, there's a third uh, issue with them and it's really not that significant and that is there is some voltage drop across the diode. In other words you don't get a 100 percent yield. Uh, if we fed in the 120 volts on this side in reality you'd probably get say 53 or 54 volts on this side. Okay they uh, they do absorb uh, some of the voltage during the rectification process. Now let's move on to some practical applications of this knowledge. And the first type of power supply that we'll discuss will be the half wave rectifier. Okay, here we have a 1 to 5.4 ratio power transformer. When we input 120 volts of RMS on this side, then we get out 650 volts of RMS on the secondary. Because this power transformer has a grounded center tap, from this point, the center tap, up to this wire, the output will be 320 volts RMS, and the output from the center tap down here to this wire will be 325 volts RMS. And that's why you'll see transformers like this referred to as a 325-0-325 power transformer. Now we're going to use our half wave rectifier, in this case, to provide a negative bias voltage to be applied to the grids of our output tubes. I'm sure if you've ever looked at schematics of a lot of different amplifiers, including most of the larger Fender amps, you'll see this. Sometimes they have their own dedicated tap on the power transformer. Sometimes they just come off of one of the existing uh, taps. In this case I've drawn a dedicated tap and due to the distance between the center tap and it, it's not going to put out 320 volts like this portion of the winding wood. Instead from here to here is going to put out about 200 volts of RMS uh, AC and uh, we see here uh, this is our input and we see that our output's a little bit larger than the input, whereas the 325 volt output, the voltage peaks are much taller than the input peaks. Now we're going to run this 200 volt AC output through a resistor of some sort to bring it down to about, say about half value. Okay, where the voltage drop across this resistor then will be around 100 volts and uh, we'll drop it down to 100 volts. RMS. Then we run it through our diode and you notice due to the uh, orientation of the diode <clears throat> only the negative portions of the wave are going to be allowed to pass. Why do we do that? Well uh, the bias voltage to the grids has to be negative so we orient our diode in such a way that only the negative portions of the wave pass then we use a smoothing capacitor here to fill in the big ripple gap between those uh, wave uh, peaks 
and we end up with a fairly smooth but not perfect output to our tube grids. Now you're probably thinking, wow, there's still some ripple there, why don't I hear hum? It's because we're sending this to the output tubes and the amount of voltage that we're sending will be relatively small compared to the voltage that will exist in the tube. And therefore, the hum that this much uh, ripple right here might be able to produce in the tubes would not be audible. If we sent this to a preamp tube and then amplified it several times, you would hear hum. But since it's going to the output tube grids, we can get away with still having some ripple in our bias voltage. Well, I hope all of this has made sense. Uh, I hope that we benefited from a brief review of the uh, principles and terminology involved in this topic. And now we're ready to move on in uh, part two to look at uh, the difference between uh, full wave rectifiers and full wave bridge rectifiers. So that's about it then for part one. I hope to see you in part two. Thanks for watching. See you there. Okay, Rusty, here's your cookie. That's good. You already sat down. Now, let's shake paw. Shake paw. Good boy. Good boy. Now speak. Speak. Good boy. Boy, he's just full of enthusiasm. Now, if I could only get him to work like this when there's no food involved.